Nearly a century ago, today's largest convenience store chain opened its first set of doors in Dallas, Texas. What followed was revolution. Big gulps, slurpees, and seven selects grew a measly Lone Star Ice House into an 80,000 location global empire. So, today we're taking a big bite out of the history of 7-Eleven. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. And let us know in the comments below what other iconic convenience stores you would like to hear about. Now, grab a hold of your preferred sized gulp and let's get to it. Way back in 1927, the General Electric Monitor Top Refrigerator hit the U.S. market, carrying with it a $500 price tag, which, accounting for inflation, is over eight grand in today's money. Needless to say, many couldn't afford the monitor top. And demand for ice houses, businesses that stored and delivered ice for household use, remained strong into the following decade. That same year, four Texas ice houses merged together to form the monolithic Southland Ice Company. This merger, right out of the gate, gave the Southland Ice Company eight separate ice plants in over 20 different retail locations all around the Dallas area. Shortly thereafter, two fateful decisions were made. John Jefferson Green, an employee at one of the Southland retail locations, asked Joe Thompson, one of Southland's founders, if he could start selling milk, eggs, and bread at his storefront. He got the go-ahead from Joe, and the convenience of being able to pick up a staple item in one place made John's location an overnight success. It didn't take long for all Southland Ice Company locations to start selling basic necessities as well. Around that same time, a Southland manager took a trip to Alaska and brought back with him a souvenir totem pole. Legend has it that he plopped that totem pole down in front of one Southland Ice Company location. And it wasn't long before people associated the totem pole with the Southland brand. So the company decided to lean into this association, renaming their storefronts Totem Stores, which highlighted their newfound totem pole image and demonstrated to customers that they could tote their purchases home with them. Taken together, these changes launched the Southland brand to success, making their storefronts the first ever American convenience store chain. Unbeknownst to them, the Great Depression was just around the corner. And as the 1920s turned into the 30s, and all of America slid face first into a financial pit, Southland struggled to stay afloat. After going through bankruptcy in 1931, the company decided to capitalize on the repeal of prohibition, upping the beverage game even further. Soon, the company got back on track, and so too did Southland. By the end of the 1930s, thanks in part to their adoption of booze, the company had grown to nearly 60 retail locations. What's more, with the onset of World War II, they also became the primary ice supplier for the all-new Camp Hood in Killeen, Texas, the Army training camp that would eventually grow into today's Fort Cavazos. Southland now had all the capital they needed to come out of the war swinging. At the war's end, and with a corresponding increase in spending, Southland extended their storefront hours. Their totem stores would thereafter be open seven days a week, from 7 in the morning till 11 at night. Therefore, in 1946, with the help of the Tracy Locke advertising firm, they rebranded their entire operation 7-Eleven, and all existing locations were remodeled and expanded. Two years later, John P. Thompson, son of the aforementioned Joe Thompson, took his place on the company's board of directors. And in the 1950s, he used this newfound influence to change the way 7-Elevens were established. He pushed the company to study traffic patterns, influencing the opening of new storefront locations specifically in high volume areas. And that way, it wouldn't just be their inventory and hours that made 7-Elevens convenient. It would also be where they were located. John's idea paid off, and he soon landed himself Southland's vice presidency. By the end of the 1950s, he'd used this new position to push 7-Eleven storefronts beyond the borders of the Lone Star State into Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. The company bought up existing convenience store chains, too, expanding their operations into half a dozen other states in the 1960s. After purchasing around 100 California Speedy Mart locations in 1963, Southland pivoted their growth strategy. Speedy Mart had grown as a result of franchising, and Southland figured the 7-Eleven chain could adopt this model, too. So they created their own franchisee training program, and by 1965, they grew their 7-Eleven chain to over 1,500 locations. By 1970, that number would grow to nearly 4,000. As 7-Eleven underwent this period of exponential growth, 
new ideas were being tried at locations all across the country. In 1962, after a raucous University of Texas football game, an Austin 7-Eleven received such continuous foot traffic that they didn't close up shop until sunrise. This location soon forsook its namesake and did something unprecedented. They decided to stay open 24 hours on the weekends. The next year, a Las Vegas location followed suit. Soon after, 24-7 7-Elevens were popping up just about everywhere. All the while, a new invention was rocking the cold beverage market. In the late 1950s, Dairy Queen franchisee Omar Nedlik used parts from an automobile's air conditioner and created the world's first prototype for a frozen beverage machine. After tinkering with this prototype for half a decade, his branded Icy machines were made publicly available by the mid-1960s. 7-Eleven swooped in and bought some of these machines. And in 1966, they created their first ever Slurpees. At first, these slushy treats came in only cherry and Coca-Cola flavors, but they would eventually expand to include everything from blue raspberry to pina colada. Then, in 1969, 7-Eleven opened their first Canadian locations, marking the company's first foray into international markets. By 1973, they licensed Ito Yokado, a retail company founded by Masatoshi Ito, to bring 7-Elevens to Japan. In 1976, Southland introduced the Big Gulp, which held a whopping 32 ounces of pure, sugary goodness, a whole 12 ounces more than the company's previously largest cup. Soft drink sales doubled within just three months. Around this time, Southland raked in its first ever billion dollars in annual sales. They seemed unstoppable, but every sugar rush has its crash. In 1978, Southland bought Chief Auto Parts, and in 1983, Sitco Petroleum. These acquisitions proved more than the corporation could handle, and the massive operation began to teeter. In 1986, a rumor grew that Canadian financier Samuel Bellsberg was going to attempt a hostile takeover of the company. But the Thompson family wasn't going to let some hoser named Samuel Bellsberg beat them so easily. Thus, in 1987, the Thompsons spent over $5 billion to buy out the entire Southland management team. The only problem? The 1987 stock market crash crumbled the value of their new purchase, and the Thompson family had to immediately begin liquidating all sorts of Southland assets. Before the 80s were up, they'd sold off Chief Auto Parts, Sitco, hundreds of stores, and at long last, what remained of the company's ice division. Ashes to ashes, ice to liquid. Even with these sales, though, Southland was still broke. And in October of 1990, they filed once again for bankruptcy. And who was waiting on the other side of bankruptcy to resurrect Southland's remains? None other than Ito Yokado and 7-Eleven Japan, who would come to own a whopping 70% of the company, leaving the founding Thompson family with a measly 5%. Masatoshi Ito took the Southland presidency for himself in 1991. While he is credited today for revolutionizing the way the Japanese shop for daily conveniences, his time at the top would be a limited time deal. Multiple Ito Yokado officials were allegedly caught up in a racketeering scheme directly tied to the Yakuza, the notorious organized crime syndicate in Japan, who are much less zany in real life than the Yakuza video game series would have you believe. What's more, some Yakuza payments allegedly came directly from Masatoshi Ito's wife. Though he denied knowledge of these payments, Ito stepped down from his companies immediately thereafter. Still, the 7-Eleven brand carried on. Yakuza be damned. Uh, wait, maybe we shouldn't say that. The rest of the 90s saw the exponential growth of 7-Eleven allowing them to reach 25,000 stores by the early 2000s. And in 1999, the Southland name disappeared from the brand entirely, and the company was officially renamed to 7-Eleven Incorporated. In 2007, 7-Eleven surpassed McDonald's as the world's largest franchise by number of locations. In that same year, the company ran a promotion for the Simpsons movie, where 11 different U.S. 7-Eleven locations were transformed into replicas of Apu Nasapima Petalon's famed Quickie Mart. But even as 7-Eleven grew bigger and better, the company underwent a series of controversies. In 2015, a Sydney Morning Herald investigation found that some Australian 7-Eleven managers were taking as much as half the paychecks from their international workers, threatening them with deportation if they spoke out. With this wage theft scheme discovered, 
7-Eleven was made to pay out over $173 million in back wages. That same year, 7-Eleven launched their first ever Bring Your Own Cup Day, where customers could fill any container they wanted with a Slurpee for just a buck fifty. Naturally, people brought in kiddie pools, sleds, and even toilets. 7-Eleven had to implement harsher size rules in the years that followed. Somewhere in corporate America, a lawyer had to write the words, don't drink Mountain Dew Slurpee from a toilet. In 2018, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, raided nearly 100 7-Eleven locations in 17 separate states. They arrested 21 people for working in the country illegally, and franchisees found to be in deliberate violation of the law had their 7-Eleven contracts terminated. The following year, the California state legislature attempted to pass a bill banning the sale of unsealed sodas larger than 16 ounces. This bill would have been lights out for the big gulp, but fortunately for gulpers everywhere, it was struck down. If I don't think it's enough, then I'll get another one. So you can keep enjoying your gulps and slurpees, so long as they're not in a toilet. Today, 7-Eleven operates over 84,000 locations, with about 20,000 of those in Japan and another 10,000 plus locations around North America. That's a big bite. In the US, most locations operate under the name of 7-Eleven, but some Midwest locations operate as speedways, while many Southern locations operate as stripes. A 7-Eleven by any other name would sell just as sweet. Their Big Gulp lineup now includes the smaller Little Big Gulp, the larger Super Big Gulp, and the even bigger Double Gulp. Still, the Slurpee remains king. About half a million are sold every single day, enough to freeze every brain on the playground. <laughs> the Slurpee is such a success story, 7-Eleven literally gives them away for free. On every July 11th since 2002, that is to say every 7-Eleven, the company hosts National Free Slurpee Day, offering customers the chance to get the prized 7-Eleven confection at the low, low cost of free 99. As long as you don't bring a toilet. So what do you think? What's your go-to 7-Eleven item? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other weird history food videos.